Welcome to the Rosenfeld Review. I'm Lou Rosenfeld, and we are, um, as always, just a bunch of blind guys trying to figure out that elephant. Uh, helping me out today is Cheryl Plotz. Hi, Cheryl. Hi there, Lou. Glad to be here. It's great to have you. Um, Cheryl, you all may know um, from her speaking engagements and other uh, times she's been on stage. I met her when she gave the most amazing talk at the uh, Interaction Conference in Lyon. Would that have been 2018, Cheryl? Yes, 2018. And uh, really was blown away. And uh, long story short, um, she's now kind of the, the go-to MC of a lot of the Rosenfeld Media Conferences. She, she blew people away at Advancing Research. Uh, earlier this year, and she'll be emceeing uh, Enterprise Experience later this month. I'm talking to you in August of 2020, and um, uh, you know your your presence is aided by your your skills uh, in improv and acting and Muppets. <laughs> yes, I was a teenage Muppet. That is a factual statement. Well, um, besides being a teenage Muppet, uh, Cheryl is an internationally renowned interaction designer. That's why she makes it onto the stage at Interaction uh, and has uh, been doing amazing work with uh, Alexa and the Echo Look. Uh, she's worked on Microsoft's Cortana and the Azure platform, done work on Nintendo DS. She's, she's worked for a lot of really interesting organizations. Uh, Disney Parks, Maya Design, uh, now at uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, I'm always pretty blown away by you, Cheryl, not just because of your work and because of your stage abilities and your Muppets, but now you're writing because you're writing a book. And in fact, I think like today is practically the day author review is done and, and you can just kind of walk away from it until the, the hard part starts, namely marketing. Uh, is, that where right. you, is that where you are? You're just like, ah. Oh. I think today's the day. I, I have one more chapter, the AI chapter, to finish my edits on and then send it off to Marta. And uh, and then that's that's it for my part. It started last September, and here we are. <laughs> Which is really fast. It may not I feel I don't know. I have no reference. For, I, I have no frame of reference. <laughs> You know, I always say that books are the, the slow food of content, and uh, uh, um, you, you're, uh, you're not quite a short order cook. You're still doing high quality work, but you're, you're definitely faster than uh, many of our authors. The book is Designed Beyond Devices, Creating Multimodal Cross Device Experiences. And that's a mouthful. I know we've struggled a bit with the subtitle, at least. Um, and uh, um, I really wanted us to talk about why you thought there was a need for this book. So let's, let's wind our way back to uh, prior to last, uh, last uh, autumn uh, when you got going and think about um, why you felt there was a need. What was the gap that you uh, saw um, yawning out there and needed to be filled? I would love to talk about that. Well, um, winding all the way back to around 2016, um, had the opportunity to join the Alexa team at Amazon pretty early on, like just as we were um, ending our beta phase and le heading into general availability. And that also happened to be right around the time that uh, the team was in, in full production for the Echo Show, which nobody knew about yet except, you know, our team at Amazon. And that was like a mind-blowing time to be working on this kind of work. I, just, just to go from working on voice only and be like, wait, 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 we just figured out voice only and you just added a screen to everything all of a sudden. And so now everything's changed again. And it was really complicated. It, no one has really done a voice forward screen thing. And and that was a lot of work. And so like at the time, um, it was really exciting challenge to try to figure out like what that meant and how it was different than like, you, you know, a d dictation software or just something where you a, a grammar based desktop software or something like that. And at the time, you know, I like I pub internal to Amazon, I had like experimented with like a white paper around like, well, here's how like maybe the fire tv might be different from like an echo like those are different those are very different experiences but it didn't quite you know still really early ideas and and those 
encountered a lot of different things for the first time while I was there, but um, it, you know, it took leaving Amazon and being kind of outside of the bubble to, to let some of those ideas flourish a little bit more. Um, and at the same time, uh, leaving Amazon let me start my speaking career kind of in earnest. And as you mentioned, I had the great opportunity to uh, launch my uh, first workshop by giving voice to your voice designs at Interaction 17. Um, and I've given that on five, four or five continents now. And, you know, every time I would give that workshop, people, like, people would ask me, are you writing a book? And my response would be like, people are already writing books about voice design. I don't think I need to go and write the same book that other people are working on. Um, but, you know, I always thought like, well, maybe, maybe there's something I do have a perspective on and I haven't just, I just haven't found it yet. Um, and as, you know, as the questions came up in workshop and as I kind of came out with the talk you mentioned in Lyon about working on the Echo Look um, and the multimodal nature of kind of like the app versus the, the device and that experience and seeing how the Echo Show or Show and the Google Home kind of hit the market and, you know, Fire TV shows up on the market. Um, I started watching how that all started playing out and I kind of expected some like what a company to take the lead in that space or, or a designer to take the lead in that space um and I, I and i watched with particular interest i know christine park and john alderman had had a released a design i believe the book was called designing across senses uh for o'reilly which i read and i i kind of thought was going to be that book in that space and it's it's a very useful book for those of us who are interested in uh you know like cognitive psychology talks about how the brain processes multiple uh stimuli across senses but what was still missing for me was the how was the how should designers cope with this like, incredibly increased complexity. Like we went from a world where you could assume that a computer, a human computer relationship was the hum the computer would show things to you and then that you would move a mouse and a keyboard around and, and haptically uh, express your intent to the computer. Now it's wide open. The computer's speaking to you. It's making sounds. It's showing things to you. It's blinking lights at you and you are waving at it and you're speaking to it and you're, you're still using keyboards and mice and just all kinds of things the complexity has gone up exponentially and at the same time like the number of devices in your world has gone up exponentially that's just a lot of complexity uh, and so designers need a stronger foundation upon which to build their experiences so that that house of cards doesn't fall down and that is what this book attempts to give designers a, a strong end-to-end -end foundation starting from uh can you know a basis built in improvisational uh, sort of games and storytelling for uh, bringing customer context to life uh, because context is so key when you're talking about things like invisible interfaces and and these these multimodal interfaces um, and carrying that through understanding human behavior and then you can understand what type of multimodal interface you want, then carrying that through to how do you prototype these experiences? How do you manifest them? What kinds of deliverables do you use to express a multimodal interface to a developer in a way that makes it manifest? And then what systems do you layer on top like AI or VR or mixed reality uh, to, to take that to next level? And then how do you vet your ideas to make sure they're even even approaching ethical or that the impact is going to be near what you thought it was going to be so that it's you're right it was hard to come up with the title well to yeah I'm, that. <laughs> i mean i think a lot of what you've been able to do is focus on on frameworks as you said models uh other devices you know well it's probably not the right term to use in this case but other ways of helping the reader go through sense making uh, because the space is is so it's it's new. It's in ways it's not, and in ways it's barely been born yet, and it's changing very quickly. Uh, you really have to have something of a foundation to learn to lean on while you learn. Um, you know, I I guess one way to look at it though is you're you're really trying to get designers to look, as you say, beyond devices to the essentially not the interface, but the interaction with something broader that spans devices. What do you call that broader experience? Is it just an experience? Or is there some other way you, you or another metaphor you use to, to help sort of shape or scope what is essentially being designed? Well, in a way, um, in chapter one, uh, it's, 
capturing kind of the customer context, I talk about a, an acronym we use in improv to explore scene work, and it's a CROW, uh, character, relationship, objective, and where. And I talk about relationship. In a way, we're kind of re designing relationships with your service it's i mean in a many in, you could you could look at it a couple of different ways like in one way this is service design right like it's you're designing uh this the the customer's relationship with the service your company is offering and the, the device is one of the many touch points of the service um but you could also look at it like a relationship it's uh, the the customer's relationship with this device the touch point or with your company and the brand um and and that it shape that happens over time and it is is shaped by the the customer surroundings and the the emotions that they're bringing to the table and their needs in the moment and the people that surround them. I'm glad you mentioned time because that's something that I've been thinking so much about in the last year or two uh, and how that I feel like you know it's kind of funny. I'll give you a, an example. Every time, and this is actually true with with your cover. Every time we de we develop a book cover, it seems like the designer of that cover and I are working on conveying motion, which is really conveying the passage of time in the cover. And um, it's true of everything we design. Like there's always this element of time, but it's very hard to communicate in a snapshot, typically on a two-dimensional plane, whether it's a cover or uh, a mock-up uh, of an interface or whatever it might be. We really struggle with that. And one of the, the really difficult things is that time moves at different rates for different actors and maybe to guide different relationships in your model. You know, uh, uh, you know the one thing happens at one cadence and another thing is happening at the same time but at a very different cadence. And we're not always prepared for that. So I guess I'm wading into these murky waters that I, I, I seem to be playing at the edge of a lot lately of time. And I'm, I'm wondering how big a deal is understanding the role of time in this context? It's a very big deal. I mean, time is such an interesting concept in voice design on its own, right? Because time becomes super precious. Every word in a spoken interface adds time to the interaction right like uh, it's and you're forcing people to listen to that extra word it generally also because people like politeness and and social constructs and all of that um so we would have arguments working on alexa like the word the could just we could go off for 20 minutes about whether that you know, uh, little tiny connective words should be there or not um but you you know you take the context of an entire system and I've got entire chapters in my book devoted to different aspects of the impact time has on an interface. Like I have an entire chapter in my book just devoted to different types of, of transitions and how they impact the, the customer experience. Uh, transitions between devices, transitions between uh, networks, transitions between... Uh, transitions between uh, inputs uh, and those all of those different things are they, they require time you can't transition without time um, there's a, a, one of the big concepts I introduce in the book it was a kind of a pair of concepts is an activity model which is uh, essentially you want to understand your customer enough to understand patterns of their behavior like to to say with some confidence to say like, well, sometimes they're super busy, for example, like they're in a state of flow. We, we believe that sometimes they're in a state of flow and we shouldn't bother them, like that we should respect their space. Or sometimes they're, they're like, they're driving a car. We like, whew, we should never, we should just leave them alone. We, nothing we could say which would ever be of interest to them. But sometimes they're super idle and, and maybe they would be interested in something they didn't ask for. Um, and whatever that means to your system, different systems are going to have different understandings of their customers uh, behavior. Um, once you have that, you also, you, you, you need to understand what different types of sort of proactive or, or proactive interruptions your system might bring forward. And between those two things, you end up with what a, an interruption matrix, like here are the different behaviors a customer might have. And then over these events in time happen and, and here's your patterns of behavior that, and those you, you're kind of 
charting all the possible different uh, patterns of experience that might happen over time. That, that's fascinating. I mean, you, you just got my brain firing away here. Uh, you know, like the, the idea that the word the becomes a, 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 a bad actor in the decay of attention spans. You know, it, in one case, one, but in another case, you might need to milk the moment because you, you, you know, that pause or, or that dragging the moment out actually has the opposite effect and in terms of getting them more engaged. And it, a lot of it, as you say, depends on the context and what they're doing at the moment. So that's tough to model all that. And yet it sounds like you really brought us pretty far ahead in that regard. And the tough part is like, there's no easy answers, right? Like it is all about the context. Like, just like you said, like sometimes the word the in that example is useful. Like, sometimes you want the extra second. Um, you Sometimes you want to ease people in when you're interrupting them because they're going to miss the first second or two of whatever you're saying because their ears are still attenuating to a sound. Um, and so a lot of it is just trying to guide people towards having strong frameworks for, for like understanding and representing what is unique about what they are building and what their customers need so that they can make strong decisions for themselves, like instead of like necessarily giving you a one size fits all answer. Because that's the other thing, like if I wrote a book that gave you a one size fits all answer today, everything's going to change. Like if I had given, written a book that gave you a one size fits all answer for 2019, uh, this would not be a very good book because everything changed in March. <laughs> yeah, as we say in Brooklyn here, forget about it. Um, what, um, are you finding uh, that people with a particular skill set, type of experience, perspective, um, respond better to designing in this context than others? Uh, or is it, again, very dependent and there's certain strengths that certain kinds of people bring, but they have weaknesses and, and others have different strengths and weaknesses. I'm just curious, uh, who do you feel really maybe is strongest at this kind of work and, and other people that, you know, uh, uh, should be doing this work, but there's a particular gap that they, you, you'd like to instruct them to fill in their expertise. Well, I'll preface by saying as I've aged, I've become a big believer in the growth mindset. So I believe anybody can like choose to engage with this and and a adopt like this mentality. However, uh, from experience, it is a little harder for folks who have come from a strongly like who've trained heavily, like in a visual minds like from from like a graphic design perspective to make this leap because a lot of the systems. That, that we talk about are like invisible systems. So like people who have come from a computer science background or like a cognitive psychology background where um, they're used to talking about processes that are invisible, it's a little easier to make the leap. That's not to say that, that people who are coming from a visual background are incapable of making this leap. And in fact, they have a great advantage in the fact that um, one of the biggest problems in working in this space is when you're trying to work with your development partners, they are so deeply hungry for some kind of visualization of yeah. what the heck to build. And that was like, when I showed up with a flow diagram for the Echo Look for the first time, they were like, wait, 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 you do this? We haven't seen one of these in a long time. And so that's one of the many things that, that needed to make sure at least I had a chapter in there for like how to transform these kinds of things into uh, visualizations that to, to help bridge that gap. And so there's a need for people who are visual thinkers to uh, kind of step up to the this space. But also I don't, you know, I've made this point with, with um, voice designers. I don't think that like this, this is going to be a silo. Like I think that this kind of awareness will benefit a lot of different people. And just like mobile design, like, yeah, there were specialists at first, but it will kind of spread out over time as, as this way we're all going to need to be aware more of these general principles over time. So we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to the Rosenfeld review. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. If you want more, not only do we have a whole bunch of podcasts in our archive, but we have something that's very current, very alive, and very engaging for groups. And 
that is our communities. Rosenfeld Media runs a variety of communities that meet on a monthly basis for video conferences on a variety of topics near and dear to UX people, ranging from an enterprise experience to advancing research to design and research operations. I want to encourage you to join one of our communities. Again, it is free by going to rosenfeldmedia.com slash communities. Not only will you get a monthly video conference that you can listen in on and participate in, ask questions and so forth, we'll give you access to the recordings. And uh, for some of those communities, we're talking about dozens of recordings with really interesting presenters and facilitators. You'll also get a newsletter. You'll get access to an advice columnist. Yes, we actually are providing advice columnists for each community. And finally, if you're interested in our conferences, our communities correspond to our conferences. So you will be the first to know when, programs, uh, when programs go live, uh, when tickets go on sale, and by the way, most of our conferences sell out, and other good things about our conferences, such as uh, when the scholarship applications open up. So go to rosenfeldmedia.com communities. You're going to find something that's free, something that's interesting, and it's a great opportunity to find your tribe as well. We'll see you there. Hi, welcome back to the Rosenfeld Review. I'm Lou Rosenfeld. I'm joined by my guest, Cheryl Platts, author of the forthcoming Rosenfeld Media book, Design Beyond Devices, Creating Multimodal Cross-Device Experiences. Cheryl, this has been a really great conversation, but it's also been a very conceptual conversation. And as you said, the conceptual people are the ones that, you know, maybe um, pick this type of work up most quickly. Um, but let's let's go to something a bit more concrete to try to really bring home the concepts. What's a good example that you would use uh, if you were in an elevator and somebody asked you what you what you do and, hey, I just wrote a book. Oh, on what? Sure. Well, I'll start with what I actually call my elevator pitch, and then I'll go really concrete for okay. you. So when when somebody who's not a designer is like, what's your book about? <laughs> and I know I can't give them a 20 minute pitch. I'm like, well, uh, my design, my book is uh, the manual for uh, designers who want to design the experience for the Starship Enterprise. You know how they can move <laughs> seamlessly from like the bridge with the physical controls to the touch panels, and then they can talk to it. Uh, it's it, it tells them how to do that. Um, so that that is like the elevator pitch um now um more concretely for people who either don't know star trek or uh who who just want to get down into the details uh an example i walk through specifically in my book um one of the interviews i have in my book is with brad frost who wrote atomic design and kind of extends that model uh, for multimodal design and one of the reasons um i think multi multimodal design is important uh, one of the many reasons we talk about is inclusive design the more choices a customer has, the more options they have to complete a task, uh, the more you're able to adapt to their needs in the moment. So whether they have a permanent or a situational disability, uh, you are accommodating their needs. And so if we take the example of uh, like a simple multimodal radio, maybe you're not actually going to go out and design a radio. Maybe that feels old fashioned, but it's at least a concept we all understand. And let's say this is a super uh, stripped down radio. So it's just a radio where you can browse radio stations, you can control the music or mute the music. So it's, you know, uh, it's a very simple appliance, maybe something you could control in like a public space if public spaces were still a thing that existed. Uh, so how could you design a system, a multimodal radio that not only allowed you to maybe use touch controls, but allowed you to control with gesture and with voice? because touch controls now are no longer particularly sanitary in a public space. So we've got to solve that problem some other way. Uh, now, when we look at this as a design system, we need to kind of break apart the different interactions and, and think about them as uh, sort of customer goals, uh, uh, like toggles, like uh, diff you know, uh, toggling the mute on and off. We think about that as a distinct sort of pattern or intent or goal. And then we can think about what gesture might we use as a toggle. And then we can apply that consistently across our interface. Um, similarly for, uh, for browsing, we might think, okay, well, what's uh, choosing between a, a, a set of options? What, what gesture might we use to choose between a set of options? Uh, for voice, we might say, okay, uh, 
what what do we use to uh, what words do we use to select from uh, to turn something on and off again uh, what pattern do we use is it on off is there a modifier word how do we you know what is that pattern that we use there um, so you can see how already there's a couple of choices we have to make how those choices might be different from system to system um, but we can make choices and apply them consistently across a design system the voice design for the system says, okay, when we apply an on off pattern, it's a word plus on off. Uh, when we do toggles for gesture, it's I put my palm flat out and then push it towards the system to turn it, you know, turn something on and then I pull it back towards me to turn it off again. Um, to, uh, to browse, I say next and previous, or I just swipe my hand left and right. Well, you know, um, uh, I apologize to the listener. You're you're listening, but I'm seeing what Cheryl's doing, <laughs> and and there are just tons of gestures going on on the video. Um, you know, the idea of a design system in this context is really fascinating, and uh, I I wonder how how universal design systems can be, because in in a lot of cases that you're talking about, they are cultural. So the gestures that we make in the United States versus the gestures in Italy could be, you know, substantially different. What are the, how far are we in terms of creating maybe not universal design systems for the kind of, kinds of devices we're developing now, but at least some sort of loose commonality, for lack of a better term? It's an excellent point, particularly about the challenges with gesture. Uh, both voice and gesture are particularly regional and gesture more so even than voice. And I would say we're pretty darn far away from any sort of universal language when it comes to gesture. And I'm not sure that there's any movement towards universal things. And I think ev things that one thing you learn very quickly when you start to do gesture design and you, you, you make any look at the rest of the world is things you assume are very universal are not. Like almost everything we assume, uh, whether it's left, right, or it's thumbs up, or it's even single finger pointing, like almost everything that you assume is universal in one culture is the opposite somewhere else. So um, design systems end up being very, when we talk about natural user interfaces, it's funny because it's like regionally natural. Uh, almost all of them have to be adapted to the local the, the the local context, which again comes back to that whole the importance of context and why like chapter one it's like you have to capture your customer context like one size does not fit all, um, and the same applies to a certain extent for voice too because of course uh, regional dialects and and language and uh, vernacular there's all kinds of things that can impact even why one language doesn't sound the same from state to state or from neighborhood to neighborhood but it's particularly tough with gesture and gesture even if you're in the same culture uh, people's heights are different people's skeletons are different uh, people's flexibility is different so uh, there are a lot of reasons why like the connect had a hard road um, there's situations where gesture still has a lot of potential but it, it is very it is very challenging input <laughs> to, to navigate uh, you're making me sort of rethink design systems in general i mean we try to define them typically for a narrow set of, of interactions uh, within an organization, maybe. Maybe that's as broad as we go. And, and uh, in the course of the last couple of minutes, you've brought me to thinking about them at a much broader scale. And now I'm like kind of running in the other direction. Like maybe even the design systems we're trying to build today are, are, are too broad or too ambitious considering the context in which they're used. I wonder if encapsulation is just the answer. Like it's it's the ability to, to build little design Legos is not inherently flawed. It's just the fact that it's the, you know, there's going to be a lot more Legos than we ever thought there were going to be. And by encapsulation, you mean like the fact that a design system can uh, detect context and, and behave differently based on that context, but still cohere as a, as a single design system. Yes. And so, you know, it might know that um, I live in Italy and so it's going to pull up, but it knows what region I'm in in Italy. So it's going to pull up the specific dialect that, that's appropriate for my neighborhood and for my uh, 
voice recognition system and the particular gesture recognition system that's appropriate for my culture. Um, and the, because the way the system was engineered, it's capable of kind of swapping those things out. Um, and the only way you get a system that's capable of doing those swaps is partially by doing the design work and encap like creating the abstract concepts and saying like, well, human beings intense uh, correlate to like, they need to do this toggle action. They need to do be able to select from a set of things. And then here's all the different ways that different cultures will, are going to represent that intent in different ways. So no wonder why AI is really important to consider here. Although I would potentially <laughs> argue that the real big challenge to all this is IA. But um, I think we're going to have to leave that for uh, another conversation. And, and uh, uh, Cheryl, this has been great. Um, I want to, before we uh, say goodbye, ask you um, another question, which is uh, what have you read or who do you think of that's really inspirational and that you want our listeners to know about? Well, I know uh, I've mentioned this individual in a couple of my talks. So some folks who are familiar with my work have probably heard this one before, but I'm going to mention them again because it's just been so influential to my work. But uh, Clifford Nass, uh, the book Wired for Speech, has just, you know, I read it and it just blew my career open to, to the work talks about how our brains are essentially at this point in evolution anyway fairly incapable of distinguishing devices that speak from speaking humans and the implications that has for uh, the emotional impact of spoken interfaces and our uh, our expectations of how those devices behave uh, of the, like the, the social contract and all that and it just um, even when they can see the device that's speaking um, and there's there's so much there like the gender implications um, so if if you're at all interested in like spoken interfaces or multimodal interfaces. I cannot re recommend that book highly enough. Unfortunately, Cl Clifford Nass is no longer with us, but his book is, um, and and Scott Brave, a uh, co-author on that book, and uh, it just just excellent, excellent reading. And that's Nass and A S S. Yes. And you are Platz, P L A T Z. That's I, correct. I, I think I mispronounced it with a little bit of a Yiddish inflection earlier. Not my intent, but I managed to always. Uh, bungle someone's name on, on my uh, podcast, no matter how well I know them, at least every couple of months. So my apologies for <laughs> it's that. It's all good. I do those things too. <laughs> Cheryl, it's, it's great to have you. Um, if the listeners, you folks out there want to learn more about Cheryl and her work, well, I'll just mention the book again. It should be out in, I think we're thinking October, November of 2020, uh, Design Beyond Devices, Creating Multimodal Cross-Device Experiences by Cheryl Platts. And, uh, we are so excited to get that book out. If you do want to learn more about Cheryl in the meantime, her Twitter handle, it's just changed to uh, funny godmother. And uh, all I can do is think about uh, given that handle and your acting abilities, um, I will anticipate a very strange Godfather four movie is <laughs> on the horizon. Cheryl, great to have you join us. Thank you so much, Lou. Take care. for listening to the Rosenfeld Review brought to you by Rosenfeld Media. If you like our show, please subscribe and review it on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast platform. I'd love it if you tell a friend to have a listen. And please check out our website for over 100 podcasts with other interesting people. You'll find them all at rosenfeldreview.com.